Today, um, my talk is going to be an introduction, but also something fairly technical on energy storage, how we can build better batteries faster. And as Joe introduced, I'm an engineer um, by training. And what I'm gonna talk about today is using the latest advancements in data science in order to reach the net carbon neutrality that is required for us to be sustainable. And I always like to begin with a personal touch. All right, well, if my slides were working, I was going to share with you four photographs that I took when I was a young undergraduate student at Caltech. So I, am, I was an amateur landscape photographer, so I travel in the American West taking pictures. I was gonna show you four pictures, one from Yosemite Valley, one from Death Valley, another one from the Bristocombe Pines in the White Mountains at the border of Nevada and California, and so forth and so on. So had I shown you those, I think you would appreciate where I'm coming from in terms of finding a sustainable solution for our energy systems. So let me begin with some major trends. This is the trend in the cost of electricity generation. What I want you to focus on is the green box down there, which is what is offered by fossil fuel today. And I'm showing you wind, solar, and concentrated solar in terms of the price of electricity as a function of time from 2010 to 2020. And the main takeaway here is that the cost is approaching and exceeding what is available by fossil fuel today. So this is a very exciting news. That means wind and solar power electricity is cost competitive now. Another major trend, and I just got a sense of this from the audience, is transportation. This is actually taken a couple of years ago, and you can see that at that time in 2019, we just break the mark of five million passenger vehicles sold. And to put this in context, we have a billion or so vehicle on the market on, uh, uh, worldwide. So this is very exciting, but still a very, very small fraction of the total automobile market. And then finally, I wanna talk about battery technology. So electric vehicles are enabled by lithium ion batteries. And if you look at the cost learning curve, it also taken a huge steep dive in 2005, the average price of a lithium ion battery at the battery pack level, so that would be the level of your car, is on the order of about $1,500 per kilowatt hour. And this paper was written in 2015, and it was, at that time, around $400 per kilowatt hour. And at that time, they were projecting in 2020, it would be somewhere around 300, so how good is the projection? Actually, today we are at $137 per kilowatt hour at the pack level, so the projection wasn't very good at all. So these three trends gives you a sense of what's going on in terms of electricity. You have very affordable, clean, renewable electricity being generated. You have batteries to store the energy as some systems like transportation, and you have the emergence of electric vehicles. So 10 years ago, None of these were true, so we are truly witnessing a major transition. Now, I'm gonna tell you and get into the technical part of the work. Uh, before I do so, I just want to acknowledge everybody who have contributed. We are a university, we're powered by our students and trainees, and these are the many people at Stanford and elsewhere that have contributed to the work that I'm about to present to you on how we can build better batteries faster. So, to get into batteries a little bit, uh, this is maybe what you're familiar with, a AA battery or a cylindrical battery. This is actually the battery self fact form factor used in a Tesla um, car, very similar to the one used in a Tesla car, the cylindrical cell, and it has an energy of about 10 or so watt hour per cell. The grand challenge in battery technologies is that you have to control chemistry across many scale, both in length and in time. So let me zoom in on length. So if you look into the battery, you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking, you go very quickly from the watt hours level at the cell to the peak of watt hours at the building blocks. These are grains in the battery materials, and that's about 10 microns or so large. And then of course you can go to the atomic scale as well. 
So this gives you a sense how difficult it is to master the length scale that is involved in, of course, the energy scale. Another way to view the problem from the engineer and scientist perspective is time and length scale plotted together. So here the y-axis, that's the time scale, so that describes the lifetime of a battery, which is about 10 or so years. And on the bottom is picosecond, that's roughly how long it takes for a lithium ion to hop between one atomic position to the other. So you have to master this 10 orders of magnitude. And then the x-axis already talked about from the nanometers to the meters. And what we seek to do at Stanford is to really learn these two vast time and length scales. So at the atomic scale, you know, we're dealing with chemistry. And if you go to the nanoscale, then we're dealing with nanomaterials. If you go to the micron scale and the centimeter scale, we're looking at devices. And then at the meter scale, we're talking about the system. So that could be an electric vehicle or a large stationary storage battery for the electricity grid. And what we're doing is trying to connect insights from the materials level to the device level to the systems level. And we're using all sorts of methods available to us, whether it's synthesis and manufacturing, analytics, modeling, and so forth. And at Stanford, we're really delighted to have about 200 faculty, students, postdocs, and staff working on this together. We have organized ourselves into the Storage X initiative. While the talk today is mostly about lithium ion batteries, X means we can store in anything. Heat, elevation differences, for example, pump hydro, and everything in between. And these are some of the faces of my colleagues that are contributing to this different aspect of time and length scale. Some people are working on EV battery pack, others are working on atomic level chemistry. And what we're seeking to do is to connect everything together. Next, let's talk about the battery value chain. So how do we actually develop and make a battery? Well, we have to start with the raw materials. We have to mine them somewhere, whether it's lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and so forth. We have to be able to formulate the chemistry. We have to be able to synthesize it. Then we have to manufacture it into a battery cell like the picture I showed you. And we also have to be able to integrate it into devices for the grid, for automobile, and others. And then at the end of the life of the battery, we have to recycle it. So this is a very long process, both in terms of research and development, and also in the manufacturing and the recycling and so forth. And what I want to point out is that there are major decision points along this value chain. You have to make decisions, you have to evaluate, you have to down-select each step through the way. And it's extremely time-consuming and resource-consuming as well. And this goes back to my title, is how do we build better batteries faster? So the talk today is about using the most modern data science approaches to help us accelerate. So I thought I would begin by talking about all the challenges with battery. Why does it take so long to build a good battery? Well, the design space is very large for batteries because it's essentially a chemical plant merged into a small device, okay? The assessment times, so if I want to know if a battery is working well, it takes a long time, it is because batteries last a long time. So a car typically is rated for something like 100,000 miles, eight years. So without acceleration, that's how long it's going to take for me to see if it's working well. A Tesla Model 3 carries some 4,000 battery cells, so variability is a big problem. As we have heard recently, for example, in the Chevy Bolt, rare events such as you know, PPM level battery defects can lead to real safety issues, but they're also very hard to identify. And that was a $1.8 billion mistake, and that's increasing in magnitude as well. And then at the end, if you have to do all these things, it just takes a lot of resources. And this is why it has taken batteries a long time to get to where it is today. So what are our goals? First, I think we will need to be able to learn the design space and optimize it as quickly as possible. We also want to be able to predict the outcomes because we can't wait eight years to iterate one variations of the battery chemistry. 
we have to not only make predictions of the mean, the average behavior, but we also have to predict the variations as well. Because when you put 4,000 batteries together into a single battery pack for a car, the variability is actually what governs how well the battery behaves. You have to predict rare events. As I just mentioned, for example, the Sheffield Bolt is a rare event. It's only 70 parts per million failure rate. Uh, but that's enough to cause a $1.8 billion recall. And then finally, this is something that engineers like myself have a hard time accepting, is we need to balance the throughput with accuracy. We need to achieve the throughput that is necessary while being willing to leave, live with some degrees of uncertainty. So how do we balance that? Uh, those of you who have spent a long time in, his, uh, in industry knows you know, something like risk ramp. You need to make a decision, ramp things up, even though you're not 100% sure. And this is something that the battery field has not really mastered. So these are the problems we're trying to solve. These are the bottlenecks for accelerating battery innovations. So I wanna give a few more examples and context. So what does acceleration mean to the players in the market? So I chose three players in the supply chain. The first one is materials and chemical suppliers. These are the companies that would make active materials, that they would make the liquids and inactive materials in the battery. So what are their design spaces and opportunity? Well, they're designing chemistry and they are scaling up the manufacturing into the kiloton scale to power our electric vehicle economy and the size of the design space is typically very large. 30, 50 parameters is very routine. So if you take that size and you do some simple math, it's an intractably large permutation that you have to deal with. So what are the opportunities here? Well, you can shorten the time it takes to discover a new material and optimize it. You can also be optimizing the synthesis and the chemistry and the scaling up. So this is not very different, say, what pharmaceutical industry has been doing in the past decade as well to speed things up. If you are in the business of making battery cells, so those are the, the individual cell that you see or maybe it's in a larger format, the space is a little bit different. You're typically thinking about how to manufacture the cells, but they're equally large number of parameters, typically several dozens of parameters are involved in making battery cells. And the opportunity there is to decrease the manufacturing time and also to be able to predict safety events statistically so we can catch something before it happens. And then finally, we have the EV manufacturers. And here, their design space is also different. Here we're looking at the operating envelope of the battery, so this is what's called the battery management system. This is what tells you how many miles you have left in your car and how the charging is controlled and so forth. And another interesting design space is battery recycling. So when do we take the battery out? Can we assess the residual value, much like how you can assess the residual value of a used vehicle? This could be also an opportunity to assess the residual value of a used battery pack to enable a reuse market. And the opportunities are equally important here. For example, you can decrease the qualification time, how long it takes for a company like Tesla to say, well, this is a good battery for us, this is not a good battery for us. And these are extremely large opportunities, all you know, with a potential reward financially in the tens of billions. So now that comes to the technical part of the talk. So we know the problem, we know the players, we know that it can be helpful, so how do we do it? How do we take this multi-year development cycles and shorten it substantially? So here I would like to introduce you what a machine learning pipeline looks like for batteries. So this is taking modern data science approach and asking the question, can we speed things up? So typically how this works is we have to determine an objective. So our objective be let's build a longer lasting battery or let's build a safer battery or both. We have to be able to get a sense of how everything works, and this is known as training in the machine learning world where we make observations and then we try to learn what is the reality. Now, please don't be confused with machine learning use, for example, in social media. 
Human behaviors are typically not governed by physical equations. I think all of us know that pretty well. But physical systems, like batteries, are governed by physical constraints. So here we don't just want to take a bunch of observations, like what you will do for Facebook, for example, but we want to be able to take the data and engineer them using some physical constraints. And then we also want to be able to collect the data very quickly. So unlike social media, the data isn't already there. I have to carry out measurements to get them. So parallelized data collection is another important aspect. Once you have created this model aided by physical constraints, then you can do the next part, which is what we call active learning. The active learning is let's do additional measurements and decision making in order to achieve the objective. And here, this is what we call strategic explorations. So we have this huge 10 to the 30 design space, for example, that we have to navigate. So how do we quickly find the combination that helps us achieve the result? And that's what's called active learning. And you run this in the loop, and in principle, it would lead you to time saving. What I really want to highlight here is this modern informatics approach here really is the convergence of data and physical models. The two coming together lead us to predict things into the future, so this is forecasting, and also take that 30-dimensional space and compress it down to something that's easier to understand. So we call that a reduced descriptor. So these are the pipeline that we can use in order to speed things up. So many years ago, um, Stefano Erman and I, he's a, a professor in computer science, got together and say, ah, this ought to work. It all seems pretty simple, but practicing it is a different story. So what I'm gonna do in the next 20 minutes is to walk you through several interesting examples over the past five years that we have found to illustrate the utility of this approach. <clears throat> Before I do that, I just wanna point out one thing. This is a very technical schematic. So all I want you to see here is the blue boxes are the physical models, the pink boxes are the data-driven models, and this schematic shows you the many different ways the two can come together. The biggest challenge for us now is how do we combine massive amount of data with very predictive physical models? And that is at the forefront of the battery field today. And combining these two is making this a very unique challenge in the modern data science community. So I'll talk about the platform. So what do we have, what have we built to solve this problem? Well, first, we need to have what I call cradle to grave data. So from the birth of a battery to the death of a battery, we need to know everything about it along the way. Okay, so this is a data set that captures the entire lifetime of that. Not just measuring its performance, but also making all sort of analysis throughout the way to see how the battery is evolving. The second platform is something that we're very excited, and we call it closed loop optimization. So how do I run optimization automatically in the loop to achieve the goal? So this is realizing the schematic I showed you earlier, and what we're doing here is we are predicting what will happen with the battery and using the prediction to navigate in a high dimensional design space, leading us to choose the most favorable outcome. So you can think of this as a battery robot of some sort that lives in the computer. This, by the way, not only works in an R&D setting of developing better batteries, but you can actually also use it in the field. This is a paper from my colleague in Aachen, Germany, who are integrating this approach with a cloud-based system to get it from cars. And as the car is being driven, then important decisions are being made on how the battery should be operated. The third platform is a physical one, as I mentioned. In order to engineer better batteries, we have to evaluate them, and then to evaluate them, we have to test them. If you come and visit our lab at Slack, just up on Sand Hill Road, you will see a massive facility that is testing batteries from beginning of life to end of life. And we're able to conduct thousands of experiments in parallel in order to collect the necessary data set. 
The fourth and the final platform is data analytics. So you're collecting all of this data from batteries, and you don't want to handle this by hand. So we're generating terabytes of data each month. So we have been developing an automated pipeline to ingest the data, to process the data, and then to output the insights. So taking these four platforms, we are realizing a informatics-based system in order to design better batteries. So without further ado, let me give you a few examples of what we've been up to. So the first example I want to show you is how we're able to predict the performance of batteries far into the future. So again, why is this needed? The qualification time for batteries is very long. So if you can know within a few days of starting the measurement that the battery is going to be good or bad, then you can choose to stop the experiment. So what we've done here is taken several hundred automobile batteries, and we tested them in our lab, and we constructed this large data set, about half a billion data points. And then we asked the question, can we just look at the first few days of behavior and predict its lifetime over the course of several years? So this is a lot to look at, but I'll just walk you through the main parts of it. This is a measurement of how much energy the battery can deliver as a function of the number of times you charge and discharge, okay? So the various curves represent individual batteries. If the curve is very flat and goes all the way out, that means the battery is lasting a long time. If the curve is very steep, like the blue one, that means the battery failed very quickly. And I labeled it by color. So the short-lived batteries are blue, and the long-lived batteries are red. And what I want to be able to do here is, this is showing data across 1,000 cycles, which take a considerable amount of time to gather. I want to look just at the beginning of it and see if I can rank and sort the battery without knowing the future. So the plot on the bottom shows you just the first 100 cycle of the charge and discharge. So I'm just zooming in to the first 100 cycle and plotting it below. So immediately you can see just by eye, there's no correlation. Now the color are out of order. And just by looking at that part, you can't really tell other than the blue line which battery is good and which one is bad. So that was very disappointing. This is a correlation plot that shows you if I take the capacity, the energy of the battery initially, and try to correlate to the life of the battery, there's no correlation. And if I took the slope, the degradation rate of the battery, and try to correlate it, there's also no correlation, which means that the degradation is very silent in the battery early on. So this is not particularly encouraging for being able to see how the battery is failing. But then we ask the question, the curve I just showed you was only one data point that shows you how much energy the battery can deliver per cycle. But in fact, when I'm cycling the battery, I'm measuring voltage, temperature, and all sort of stuff. And that's what we did here, is rather than looking just at the energy of the battery, we're looking at the detail characteristic, the voltage, the temperature. And then we took a machine learning approach and say, let's look at how those things are evolving as the battery degrades. So we looked at about 30 different measurements, all taken from that large data set. And then we did a machine learning to correlate the salient features early in the life of the battery. So what we did is we took the curves like this and we correlate it to the life of the battery. And what you're seeing on the right is the result. We took the first 100 cycle of the battery and we were able to predict within about 90% accuracy the lifetime all the way out to 3,000 cycles. So that means in 1 30th of the time, we can predict with 90% confidence how well the battery is going to behave. So this was a very big breakthrough for the field because it was thought previously that this is impossible to save 30x in time. It only gets better from here. Often in a R&D setting or manufacturing setting, you don't care exactly how well the battery is going to behave. You want to be able to sort it. You want it to put it in thumbs up or thumbs down because you can make a decision. And that's why I'm showing here, by just taking the first five cycle, which takes less than 10 hours to get, we can immediately sort the battery into good and bad 
with, again, close to 95% accuracy. So this is kind of a thumbs up, thumb down. The previous slide shows you a quantitative prediction of exactly how long the battery is going to last. Can we do better than this? Well, I just showed you how to predict battery lifetime. But that's actually not the end game. The end game is predicting the battery degradation mechanism. Because as battery engineers, we want to know how the battery is failing. We just don't want to know it's going to fail. We want to know how it is going to fail. And this is a really great example of combining the data-driven approach and the physics-based model to do so. Again, I don't want to get into the details here. We took another related data set on automobile batteries, and we asked the question, can we identify the failure mechanism in addition to the performance of the battery? And the answer is yes. So now, in 1 30th of the time, we can not only predict how the battery will behave years down the road, we can also predict how it is going to fail. And this is being validated. So this is a very exciting progress, because this represents the solution to the first problem, which is how do we shorten the assessment time for battery technology, especially for someone who is developing battery technology. Now, I showed you this schematic earlier, which I call closed loop optimization. So what this is doing here is taking the things I just showed and building on it to turn it into a virtual robot, if you will, to achieve one purpose, which is to reach the optimal battery design as quickly as possible. So what is being added here is rather than just predicting the battery, I'm predicting the battery across a large design space. To make this more clear, let me directly show you an example. Those of you with electric cars know that charging time is a limiting factor in the acceptance of EVs. You know, it takes about 90 or so minutes to fully charge an EV car, and it takes five minutes or less to refuel an internal combustion engine car. So we picked a very simple problem, is can we optimize the ways to deliver a 10-minute fast charge? So we asked the question, if I restrict myself to a 10-minute fast charge to 80% of the battery's energy, what is the best way to do it? So at first, this may seem like a really simple problem. It is not, because there are infinitely number of ways to deliver a 10-minute charge to 80%. Okay? There are infinite combinations to do so. The reason is because how you control the speed of charging as a function of how far the charging has gone has infinite permutations. And this one just shows you here a schematic of all the possible charging profiles. So this is how quickly you can deliver the electrons to the battery and in what order should you do it. So we formulated the problem and said, OK, there are hundreds of combinations shown here in the ways you can charge a battery. If you did this by a brute force method, okay, so this is how we would do it five years ago. We would just test every single combination. We'll test it three times. Why do we test it three times? Because of the variability, so we can assess the error. So in order to identify the statistically best way to charge a battery in 10 minutes, we chose 200 permutations. That would take 500,000 battery cycles. And in the particular experiment we have envisioned here, we have taken two years. So immediately, when I proposed this, well, when my graduate student proposed this to me, I would say, well, then you're not going to really graduate anytime soon. <laughs> so we better speed it up. So the goal was to exceed this benchmark considerably. So keep this number in mind, 500,000. So how does this work? This is basically working on the principle of Bayesian optimization. So we are inferring from our measurements, what does the design space look like? So I don't want to make 200 measurements. I just want to make, say, 50 measurements. And when I make 50 measurements, I can decide where else to make the additional 50 measurements. And that's what the four iterations, the four rounds are showing. We make 50 measurements first. Then we make an additional 50 measurements, and then we compute what the landscape looks like for the design space. So the top shows you where in the design space I'm testing, and the bottom shows you the results. That's being estimated. 
So the color on the bottom shows you the lifetime. So as we change these charging profiles to get 10 minute charging, then we see initially we know nothing, so the colors are uniform. But as we iterate, you can see there is a rich spot in which the battery performance was the best. And then you can see the Bayesian optimization basically hones in on that. So how well did we do? In total, it took us 16 days to find the most optimal 10 minute charging. In contrast to the brute force of 600 days. So this again is a 30 time reduction in the optimization time. How do we get there it was actually very simple. Most of the permutations were never explored. So here, zero means no rep, no, nothing was tested. So the 100 some possibilities out of 200 were never examined. Only 61, or about a quarter, were examined once. And only three out of the 200 permutations were examined four times. So in other words, we made the repetition where it really mattered. So we did not make unnecessary measurements. We only made the measurement that contributed to finding the best possible candidate. So we did this exercise. We showed it was possible to optimize a battery problem, so how to deliver fast charging in 10 minutes, in about 30 times less the time. How do we do? Uh, this is what we call a validation experiment. So we actually tested many of them to see if we actually got the right result. So this is the true ranking on the y-axis versus the predicted ranking. So you can see we made a few errors. You know, we swapped the first and the second place, for example, but for the most part, we got it right. The second plot shows you the lifetime that we estimated versus what we predicted. Again, there's a little bit of a bias, so if everything landed on the dashed line, that would have been the best. So we're slightly off, but for the most part, we did a great job. For the last few minutes, I want to show you something else. So we now can estimate battery performance. We can identify the degradation modes in the battery, so those are great for battery engineers. We can optimize a battery problem like fast charging in 30 times the time, less than time, that's great. But how about for the battery scientist, right? So I'm a material scientist, I often ask the question, well, what's happening inside the battery? It's very hard to know. So here, I would like to pose the question how we can learn the heterogeneity of a battery. So I think most of you can appreciate that heterogeneity of materials is what leads to failure, right? The reason why we put hot water on a ceramic cup, it breaks is because of thermal expansion that is happening heterogeneously. So the inside of the cup heats up first, it expands, and that leads to fracture of the cup. Battery is exactly the same thing. If it's heterogeneous, that's no good for the battery lifetime. There are a lot of extremely powerful techniques to probe batteries, but they typically fall into two classes. The left is you can measure the dynamics, so how it changes with time, but you have no resolution. But as I showed you earlier, battery is a nanoscale device. If you don't see where exactly it's going on, you don't know what is happening. So that's the first category. The second category is exactly the opposite. You have the nanometer resolution, but you have no dynamics. So you're not following things as a function time. What we want is dynamics and spatial resolution. So what we did here was to took this two types of measurements, and we used machine learning to merge it so we can get dynamics and spatial resolution at the nanometer level at the same time. I will spare you the detail on how we did it and show you directly the result. This was our understanding prior to this work. I'm gonna show you a simulation of how lithium is entering into all the small particles you saw earlier on the second slide of my presentation. So red is the discharge state, green is the charge state. So let me play this movie. What you're seeing is what we call in chemical engineering a core shell phenomena. So you're basically charging from the outside in. Okay, every single particle. So that's what we think has been happening. I would like to remind you that uh, lithium ion battery received the Nobel Prize. Well, uh, not lithium ion battery, the inventors of the lithium ion battery received the Nobel Prize. Uh, one of the inventors, Stan Wintingham, was actually a postdoc at Stanford in the 70s. So we're proud to have that connection. So everybody has believed 
this was what's happening in the battery, including our Nobel laureates. When we applied our approach to see what the reality is by being able to estimate the dynamics with the spatial resolution, this is what we got. This is the reality. It actually couldn't be more different. In one case, you have the charging occurring from the outside in, and here you have more what I call popcorn effect in which the current is very non-uniformly distributed in the battery. So what's the message here? The message here is, if I want to engineer a better battery, I want it to be very uniform. If we want it to be uniform, we need to know where the lithium is going. And to know where it's going, I need to see where it's going. But there's no technique to allow me to see it. And machine learning can be a way to bridge the gaps and allow us to visualize what's going on. So coming back, this was the process I showed. This is how we can be using modern informatics practices to enhance and speed up batteries. Now, for the last couple of minutes, I want to zoom out a little bit and tell you what Stanford is doing as an entire community to tackle this challenge. Let me begin with just the take home message. So, if you combine battery physics and modern informatics approaches, we are indeed accelerating the battery innovation. What are the opportunities? If we can go beyond the training-based machine learning, which is what I presented today, and then be able to extrapolate the learnings with no data or very minimal data, this will allow us to predict batteries of the future without having made them to begin with. We should accelerate not only research and development, but also scaling up, right? We're building gigafactories, so how do we build them faster? This can also be very helpful as well. And then, most importantly, to me as an engineer, what we want to be able to do is put longer lasting, lower cost, and safer batteries that's sustainable in EVs and in the grid. That's the ultimate test of being able to deliver something to the market. What are we doing at Stanford? I would like to send three messages here. Number one, the battery industry is a very rapidly growing and a maturing one. We are working with many industry partners. We have a co-innovation ecosystems. You can see many of the significant players in the market, EVs, oil and gas, AI, and so forth. We're also catalyzing technology transfer. These are just the few companies that were founded out of Stanford in the past decade in the energy storage market, specifically. Some of these names uh, you might be familiar with. And then finally, we appreciate the importance the government can play here because they are the ones who can catalyze with the right policy for adoption, setting up production capacity, enforcing sustainability. Uh, this is our meeting with Secretary Jennifer Granholm uh, in July, where we told her about the intersection between Stanford, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory up on Sand Hill Road, and then the Silicon Valley. And if I can be allowed just one shameless plug before I end here, I myself have decided to partake not only in the research in the university side, but also entrepreneurship as well. So I founded Mitra Kim actually during the pandemic, where we are integrating fundamental science, data, software to advance the manufacturing and the skill of battery materials and to create and catalyze a North American supply chain to have more secure and sustainable and environmentally uh, friendly supply. Uh, I don't know how many of you are looking for your next opportunity, uh, but we just moved into our uh, 15,000 square feet R&D center in Mountain View. Come and visit us. We're looking for all sorts of talents. With that, I know there are many questions. I know I was only able to cover a very small section, cross-section of the research at Stanford, but hopefully I have you intrigued. Thank you very much.